Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see so many people. Um, nice to see uh, some new people come, uh, joining us. You're all very welcome. Um, uh, you, my name's Mike Frost. I'm the uh, Meeting Secretary for the Society of the History of Astronomy. Uh, ordinarily, it would be our chair, uh, Carolyn Kennett, who, uh, who who chairs the meeting. Uh, but unfortunately, Karen is not available tonight. I think she's somewhere on Dartmoor, uh, and uh, and so the uh, the uh, the uh, the mobile signal is not too good there. So she asked me to take over, which I was only too pleased to do. Um, I have some housekeeping before we start the talk. Um, Please, once uh, once uh, Ruth, our speaker, comes online, could you uh, could you mute yourselves so we don't get any uh, any background interruptions? Uh, if if you're uh, if the link's a little dodgy, then uh, perhaps you can consider switching off the video as well. Um, um, any questions you may have for the speaker, uh, could you uh, could you save them till the end? Uh, I think with Zoom talks, it, it's a little bit difficult for uh, uh, for uh, for uh, people uh, people asking questions as we're going along. Uh, so save them up for the end, or put them into the chat so that we know there's uh, there's some questions coming. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll have some questions afterwards. Uh, as I said before, we, uh, we do have quite a few uh, uh, new uh, new members tonight, uh, as, which is good. As I say, you're all very welcome. Uh, could you uh, could you give us a quick uh, indication? Uh, use the um, the reactions uh, to put up a, a virtual hand if you are a new member. If you're not a, if you're a non-member of the of the Society for History of Astronomy, I'd be appreciated. Okay, so I see uh, oh, one or two uh, 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 lines up. So, uh, like I say, uh, welcome along, and I hope you enjoy tonight's talk. I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you will. Uh, so, uh, I think that's the end of the, the housekeeping. So, I will, um, uh, I will introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Ruth. Ruth. Let me go back to, uh, the, to the speaker view. Um, uh, Ruth Borum uh, currently works for the Scottish Book Trust on their early years program called Book Book, which sounds fun. Uh, but she also freelances as a tour guide in Edinburgh, particularly on women's history walking tours. She's also a speaker and historical researcher. I finally Ruth found is, out how to get it to be just that one instead of this split screen could, nonsense. Could, could, you Neil, and Ross, Neil and Ross, please uh, mute yes. themselves. If could you could you mute if um, you're listening? Okay, Mike, carry on. Okay, uh, Ruth previously worked for the National Library of Scotland on and their John Murray Archive Project curator, and I've also done historical research for authors and for TV. This is the best bit: TV programs such as Who Do You Think You Are? Women's history is her real passion, and when time and funding allows, she's currently researching and writing a biography about Mary Somerville, the uh, the subject of tonight's talk, and also researching the Scottish 1911 census and the suffrage movement. So uh, I think, I, I hope many of the people who are listening to know, uh, already know about Mary Somerville. Uh, she's uh, one of my heroes, certainly. And if you don't, then I'm sure you're in for a treat. So it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Ruth Borum. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to uh, come and give a talk tonight. Uh, to be honest, I need no excuse to talk about Mary Somerville. She's someone that I'm very, very passionate about. Uh, some may say obsessed. I prefer for uh, passion instead. Um, and this photograph on the screen, I'll talk more about the image of Mary a little bit later on, but I always say this is the closest I've got to getting a selfie with my heroine. Uh, I am, as Mike mentioned, an independent researcher on many topics. Uh, to be honest, I think history is something I was born into. My dad started the Captain Cook Society or the Captain Cook Study Unit, as it used to be called, uh, the year that I was born. So I have grown up with history around me. And indeed, uh, my first crush when I was a kid was of Joseph Banks. So I feel like history runs through me uh, and it's uh, perhaps natural that I fell into it as a career as well. I should say at the start, I'm not an academic, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an astronomer at all. And so if there's anything I get wrong around any of those aspects, I would love to, to hear more about it. I'm still doing some research in Mary. There's quite a lot to research. She lived for quite a number of years, but my ultimate aim is to write a biography. There are some fascinating books out there already, but they concentrate quite a lot on the science that she did. And I'm looking more at her as a person overall. 
And so the one of the things I'm going to do throughout the talk tonight is talk more about the early part of her life than most books do, because I think it's a lot of the education that she received as a um, as a kid, uh, as she was growing up and when she was a young adult that really shaped a lot of the work that she did. But first of all, I want to tell you about how I came across Mary in the first place. I always find it fascinating hearing how people discovered the person that they get obsessed with. As Mike mentioned, I worked for the National Library of Scotland on the John Murray Archive project. Now, John Murray was a publishing firm set up in 1768 when the first John Murray, although we believe he may have been a Muck Murray, travelled down from Scotland to London after the Battle of Culloden. And on the journey, he accidentally dropped to the Muck, so he was just John Murray when he arrived in London. Started a publishing firm in 1768, and in 2002, the seventh John Murray of the family sold it to Hodder Headline. At the time, it was the oldest independent publishing firm in the UK. There's still an imprint of Hodder Headlines, so you will still see books with the John Murray uh, logo on it. But although the publishing firm had been sold, the family still had the archive and they wanted it to come back up to Scotland where the ancestral home was and where they had so many connections over the years. They had it valued, as all good people do when they're trying to sell something, and the archive was valued at £44 million. Pounds. Yeah, that's quite a lot of money. Let me ex quickly explain why by telling you some of the names of the people they published in the 19th century. You may recognise a name or two, uh, Lord Byron, Jane Austen, uh, Dave Livingston, Charles Darwin, Queen Victoria. You get the picture as to why the archive was worth so much because they really wanted to make sure the National Library could get it. They were selling it to us for only £33 million pounds to bargain we were getting. And my job was to explore the archive more. Although we knew about the big names, the, the ones that I've mentioned and a few more besides, there was a lot of the archive that had never been catalogued before. This photograph on the next slide uh, shows a much, much younger me with the fantastic Ginny Murray, wife of the seventh John Murray, down in the bowels of the building in Albemarle Street, a building the family still own. This was a building that the second John Murray had purchased in 1812 because of two books in particular that suddenly made him famous and rich. The first one everyone's heard of, Byron's Child Harold. It wasn't Lord, just Lord Byron that woke up one day and found himself famous. John Murray absolutely as well. But the second book is a, perhaps a bit more of a surprise. It was a very, very successful domestic cookery book. Cookbooks are not a 21st century phenomenon. They were very popular in the 19th century as well. So these two books gave him the money that he could buy this incredible building in Albemarle Street, which is in the heart of Piccadilly. And it was this building where Scott met Byron for the first time that Jane Austen would pop round to find out what was happening with her book. And David Livingston would come when he returned from his travels in Africa. And what you can see behind myself and Ginny are some of the boxes that the archives were kept in. So the current generation had created a storage space down in the basement. They put in proper storage to try and protect all of the archives. And so my job for nine months was to travel down to Alba Street, Albemarle Street for most weeks and just sit in this incredible building and look through these boxes. The things that I would find, I could then weave into any funding applications, plans for exhibitions and the like. And so one day while I was sitting there, I decided, oh, let's look at a box with a letter S and see what comes out of it. And this letter was the first that I pulled out. Never heard of the, the writer before, Mary Somerville. That ne meant nothing to me. I was intrigued the fact that it was lit written from Florence in 1857, and I started to read the letter. It starts, I was much pleased to hear from Mr Pentland that the Council of Education has adopted my physical geography and then that, and that a new edition would be required immediately. But I must protest it against it going to print till it is brought up to the present time. She then outlines all the different ways that it needs to be brought up to the present time. For example, the gold mines in California and Australia had not been discovered when she was writing the last edition. So lots of kind of news that she wants and requests for books to be sent to her, exchanging news about the family and like. And then on the second page, there was a paragraph that really leapt out at me. I've just heard news that has surprised us not a little. 
Sir David Brewster, age 76, and you can see she's underlined the age there, age 76 years old, has uh, married a few days ago to Miss Parnell, aged 26, <gasps> a grocer's daughter. You can almost imagine her kind of leaning over the garden fence and going, Psst, have you heard? I love this incredible combination of very strong business type letter. You're not going to reprint my book. I need to update it. And then this very human need to gossip. And as soon as I read the letter, I wanted to find out more. And it was from this letter that I then became obsessed. You could almost say with Mary Somerville. So let's start at the very beginning, of course. And the very beginning starts with her birth. She was born in 1780. We don't know the exact date. We know what she tells us, but we don't know the exact date because she was baptised in Burnt Island, but she was actually born in Jedburgh. The reason she was born in Jedburgh is that her mother had gone down to London to wave goodbye to her naval father, who was going off on another trip. Now, the last time he'd been going off with the Navy, he'd been captured and kept as a prisoner of war by the French for two years. So I think that his wife, wanting to spend as much time with him as possible, fearing that he might be captured again, was spending time travelling down to London, even though she was almost full term. And then as she was travelling back to, Ed, uh, to Burnt Island, which is just north of Edinburgh, a journey that would take about 10 days, she, uh, as it's been described, got caught short, i.e. she started to go into labour. Now, her sister lived in Jedburgh, which is in the Scottish borders. And I'll show you a map later on that pinpoints exactly where. And so she seems to have knocked on her sister's door and went, hello, can I have the baby? Can I come in? And so she gave birth to Mary in Jedburgh. Now, unfortunately, the birth left uh, the mother very ill. And for the first uh, little while, certainly the first few days, Mary was instead suckled by her aunt, who herself had a young child at the time. Bear that in mind, remember that, it'll become relevant again a little bit later on. So this is a modern day photograph of Jedburgh, of Jedburgh Abbey. I'll talk a bit more about that later. But as you can see from this uh, plaque, they are very proud of the fact that she was born in Jedburgh. But it's Burnt Island that really lay claim to her. This house, the white building, this is the house that she grew up in. And the square that it sits in, they have now renamed Somerville Square after her because they are so incredibly proud of her. She was brought, brought up in this uh, town. It's a coastal town and she loved it there in many ways. But she was also left on her to her own devices in many occasions. She did learn to read the Bible with her mother's help. Her mother absolutely believed in her, that everyone should be able to read the Bible. And when she was around about seven, she started to help out with the livestock that had cows and some vegetables. But her memory for words was very poor at this point. And she didn't enjoy learning the um, certain religious questions and answers that she had to for the Church of Scotland. Their minister was a very strict Calvinist and Mary found him very gloomy indeed. Mary was allowed to run wild for most of her childhood. She spent a lot of time observing the flora and fauna. On occasion, she was also able to study with the village schoolmaster who taught her to use the terrestrial and celestial globes and encouraged her to observe what she could see in the night skies. But when her father returned from one of his voyages when she was about 10, he was disappointed to see that she couldn't read or write or not very much and had no knowledge of language or numbers. So the family moved from Burnt Island in Fife to Musselburgh or Inveresk, just outside Musselburgh, which is just outside Edinburgh, so that Mary could for a year attend a very fashionable and very expensive school in Musselburgh. She was being sent there to, in her own words, write well and keep accounts, which was all a woman was expected to know. She was there for 12 months and it was the only period of formal school education she received. And she says in her autobiography, which was published posthumously, a few days after my arrival, although perfectly straight and well made, I was enclosed in stiff stays with a steel busk in front, while above my frock bands drew my shoulders back until the shoulder blades met. Then a steel rod with semicircle went under the chin, was clasped to the steel busk on my stays. 
In this constrained state, I and most of the younger girls had to prepare our lessons. And it's thanks to Ian Archibald, who lives in Brent Island, for this artwork by Lynette Gray, which just gives you some idea of what she had to put up with. Imagine being constrained in that for 12 months while trying to learn. Miss Primrose's, the school that she went to, was very expensive. And when Mary didn't do as well as it was hoped, she was brought back to Brent Island. Mary stated she finished her time at the school like a wild animal escaped out of a cage. But this idea of educating herself had been planted in her mind. And when she, when she got home, she spent a lot of time reading Shakespeare to improve her English. And after some lessons, again with a local teacher, she became absolutely absorbed in astronomy, spending as much time as possible looking at the night sky and the northern lights. It's also around about this time that her interest in mathematics started. One day, a friend showed her a ladies' magazine, which included a mathematical problem involving X's and Y's. This was her first introduction to algebra. She was very intrigued. The family, although they had some social status, were relatively poor, and she was forbidden to stay up all night reading with a candle, candles burning too quickly, too expensive. So while she was learning mathematics, she made use of the books that her brother, who was of course receiving a proper education, would have. She would memorize them. Then at nighttime, in the dark, she would work through the problems in her mind and the next morning check if she had got them right. I just think that is some determination. If you've got kids, try suggesting that to them and see if they take you up on it at all. This map, I love looking at maps and I just wanted to show this because if you've ever been to Burnt Island today, it's quite difficult to imagine the Burnt Island that Mary knew because there's now a, a railway line that goes all the way through. Uh, but this shows you the Burnt Island that Mary would have known back in 1745. This map was produced at a time when the Jacobite Rebellion was going on. So they wanted as many maps as possible in case they needed to send further troops up to Scotland. But it shows how small Burnt Island was. It's only a couple of streets, really. And the big kind of street in the middle was the high street and then just running parallel to it just to the south that's the what we now call Somerville Square so that is where Mary Somerville lived. In her autobiography she does talk about running through three lots of gardens down to the beach. Nowadays it's very difficult to get to the beach in Burnt Island certainly from Mary's old house but in those days she used to run all the way down and spend a lot of time on the beach looking at everything that was in the sea looking at all the birds and the like. And one little twist to Mary's story, this building that she grew up in, this room that she stayed in during renovation works that the Fife Council were doing in the early 1960s, so many centuries after Mary lived there, the ceiling of the bedroom that she had slept in was removed and they discovered a second ceiling with a magnificent painted representation of the planets and stars. And there's just one example here of the things that they were finding. And I just love the fact that Mary was going out at night to look at the stars, to study all of these constellations. And she had no idea that actually the ceiling that she slept underneath had it there as well. They're doing some work to try and find out who had put it up there, where it came from. Um, and they've also got uh, many of them still in pieces in fairly good condition. So there is talk, Historic Environment Scotland are the ones who've got it, about seeing if there's any possibility to refurbish it and maybe return it to Burnt Island. And I just think it's such a wonderful twist in her story that this woman who became so famous for astronomy it was all along as a child sleeping underneath the constellations as well. She received a fairly good education in Burnt Island, as much as the local teachers could provide and as much as she could get from listening in to her brother's lessons. But it was really when she went to Edinburgh during the winters of her teenage years that she started to learn, of course, the skills that women needed to learn in order to attract her husband, for that was her only purpose in life. I mentioned I love maps that we have the fantastic National Library of Scotland up in Edinburgh and they have an amazing wealth of maps which they have all put online so you can have a look at them online and you can look at a city as it grows year by year by year 
and you can overlay maps on top of each other as well. So if ever you're doing any research in Scotland, I thoroughly recommend you check it out. But I wanted to show you this map. This map is from 1793. So around about the time that Mary was kind of 12, 13, 14. So this is the Edinburgh that she would have known. I don't know how many of you have visited Edinburgh or know it at all. It's a rather large city now, much larger than this map shows. And I think sometimes we forget that when we're thinking about people in the past, how long it would have taken them to travel and the fields that they were surrounded by. So the areas in red that I have marked, this is the old town of Edinburgh. So the big red square, that's Edinburgh Castle, which very much dominates the city. A little bit further down the small red square, that's St Giles Cathedral, which you may sometimes see, uh, particularly in Britain. It's been on the TV quite a lot, what with the, the late Queen's uh, funeral and then, of course, the, the King's kind of Scottish coronation taking place there as well. The red line, this shows the bridges that were created, the South Bridge and the North Bridge to expand the city. This happened in the 18th century. And actually, I just want to read a bit from um, Mary's uncle's uh, autobiography because he says that he happened one day to be standing at a window in the old town looking out to the opposite side of the North Loch. So just north of where the castle is, that uh, space there, that used to be the North Loch, the Nor Loch. This was a man-made loch that was built for protection and it was drained to make way for the uh, new town. So he's looking out to the opposite side of the North Loch then called Barefoot's Parks, in which there was not a single house to be seen. Look at these fields, said Provost Drummond. You, Mr Somerville, are a young man and may probably live, though I will not, to see all these fields covered with houses, forming a splendid and magnificent city. To the accomplishment of this, nothing more is necessary than draining the North Loch and providing proper access from the old town. I have never lost sight of this object since the year 1725, when I was first elected provost. It was 1763 when uh, Drummond was talking to uh, Thomas Somerville about this, and it would be another 15 years before they came up with the design of the new town. Drummond unfortunately had died by then, but Thomas Somerville was still around, and his niece saw this creation of the new town. So if we now look north, you can see the new town. It's a very Georgian design. It is very all about a symmetrical design, very wide areas, big squares. This is the rich. This is where they would go. The poor would be left in the old town and the rich would move to the new town. But there are two places in blue that I have marked that actually were very important for Mary's education. The first is the kind of the blue square in the middle there. That is where the assembly rooms are. They're still there today opened in 1787 and this is where Mary went to learn to dance. Of course any good woman would know how to dance and this is how you may find yourself a husband as well and her autobiography talks about learning to dance and then the castle there were plenty of soldiers so at night time there were plenty of dances going and although Mary was quite shy she still took part in all that society had to offer. In fact she was called the Rose of Jedward, Jedward from Jedburgh and the rose, because she was so beautiful, many people thought. So she's learning how to dance, absolutely perfect. But also part of that is to do with music, which I'll mention again in a minute. And then the other blue kind of square squiggly line towards the very middle of the, but at the very top. This is where she went. And this image is the building that she went into where that blue squiggle was. She would walk all the way up to the top where those white parts are. And this is where the drawing class or the painting class of the man on the left took place. His name was Alexander Naismith, a very famous painter at the time. But he had set up a painting class for young ladies and Mary was one of many who attended. The way that you learnt how to paint, regardless of your sex, was that you watched a master at work and then you copied him. So Mary would be there with several other ladies and Naismith's daughters as well, who were themselves quite accomplished painters. Everyone would watch Naismith paint whatever he was painting that day, and then they would copy him. This became hugely crucial, I think, to Mary, and particularly to her scientific work. 
She absolutely loved painting, and this is just one example of her paintings. This is very reminiscent of Naismith's works, and you can see how copying the master has given you a flavour of his technique as well. But this one is one of my favourites. So the previous painting is held by Somerville College and it is on display there. This is held by Fife Archives and it's of Bass Rock. So again, if you know Scotland at all, near Edinburgh, there's Bass Rock, uh, which is just a stunning area. And I love this. It's quite different to the previous painting. Um, it's a lot more vibrant, uh, but I just, I love the style of it. Mary says that uh, the class was very full. I was not taught to draw, but looked on while Naismith painted. Mr. Naismith, besides being a good artist, was clever, well-informed, and had a great deal of conversation. Indeed, it was by listening to Naismith that Mary first heard about Euclid's elements of geometry. He was recommending it in terms of perspective, but it absolutely helped her further work around uh, geology and around geometry and science. It is reported that Naismith told a young lady who took lessons from him that the clever, cleverest young lady he ever taught was Miss, was Miss Mary Fairfax. And I think that painting is really important for the way that Mary wrote. It's often been described that Mary wrote with a painter's eye. Now, Mary, the works I'll come on to in a minute, but the way that she was writing meant that people who didn't understand the scientific terms could understand what she is talking about. When she's describing what you could see, she's describing it almost like it is a painting, which then helped a lot of lay people read her books and understand the things that she was talking about. And just to demonstrate how good I think Mary is, You'll recognize perhaps this painting, which is the one that I showed at the beginning, the one that I was able to have a selfie with. This is actually a self-portrait. So this is Mary Somerville doing a portrait of herself. Now, I don't know about you, I'm useless at drawing. If I was to do a self-portrait, it would be a stick person. That's all I can do. I think this is incredible. But what I also love about this is that Mary has decided what to put in as well. And you can see how important writing has become to her that that is what she wants to be portrayed doing. So she absolutely learned how to uh, paint. And this painting is at Somerville College. She also learned, of course, as a young child, all children had to learn how to play the piano, particularly important for females, for how else would you attract a husband but by playing on the piano. Now, this painting is really interesting. It's an unfinished piece by Turner. And I've put on there the official title of it at the moment, Music Party, East Cow's Castle, round about 1835. But there's a lot of debate about who the woman playing the piano actually is. So she's the one wearing black who has the back to us. There is a growing school of thought that actually this is based on a sketch of Mary Somerville that Turner did a few years earlier when they met each other in France. Certainly she was described by many contemporaries as a very good pianist and music became something that she carried on during her life. And I'd love to think that this was based on a, a sketch of Mary Somerville, because again, it shows how music became really important to her. And that's also important to her scientific work. In her second book, Mary drew on the latest experiments of the day to write two chapters on sound, introducing the emerging fields of acoustics to her readership. She was fascinated by music throughout her life, and this helped with her scientific desire for knowledge as well. And one of her very, very good friends, Joanna Bailey, who is a Scottish playwright and poet, had one of her poems put to music by Beethoven. And I'm desperately trying to find evidence that Mary listened to that. I just think it would be fantastic. And then just to show that it wasn't all about dancing and music, of course, any good woman knows how to cook. And the one thing that Mary, we know, definitely learned to cook because of her autobiography is orange marmalade. We know that because in her autobiography, she talks about how this gentleman here, Captain William Edward Parry, when he was preparing for his third voyage to try and find the North East, Northwest Passage, this is before John Franklin has got lost and disappeared up there. He invites Mary and her second husband to go and visit his ships as they are preparing for the voyage. 
and Mary talks in her autobiography about preparing some orange marmalade to give him as a present to take on this voyage. I would love to find a letter to find out what that marmalade tasted like, whether it kept them going or whether they chucked it overboard as soon as they could. I have no idea if she was any good or not, but I just think that's absolutely a fantastic way of, again, these skills that you learn as kids can sometimes come into play when you're an adult as well. And when he returned from his third voyage, uh, they uh, were informed that the name of Somerville had been given to an island so far to the north that it was all but perpetually covered with ice and snow. And that's what that map is there. Somerville Island, a small island in the Barrow Strait. So this is a map of Scotland and there are three places that were really important to Mary while she was growing up. So if you look on the, the smaller aspect of it, which I've cut out the most relevant part of Scotland, the bit in red, that's where Edinburgh is. That's a capital city then as now, and that's where she went every winter to get her education. The blue dot just above the red, that is Burnt Island. It's across the water. There's some wonderful descriptions in her autobiography of them having to get the boat across because at that point there was no bridge. So it would be rowed across to Edinburgh and her mother was petrified about this. Some wonderful descriptions of the journeys that they did. And then if you go down to the bottom and to the right, the other blue dot there, that is Jedbra. And Jedbra was important to Mary, not just because that's where she was born, but also because that's where her uncle lived, Reverend Thomas Somerville. He was a reverend to the church that was based within the ruined abbey. So this is a, an image, as you can see, of the abbey. And then there's part of the church to the uh, left of it. That's where the community, the congregation met every Sunday. And that's where he did his sermons. Now, Thomas Somerville is a fascinating man in his own right. He published a book called The History of Britain During the Reign of Queen Mary sorry, Queen Anne in 1798. He also published his autobiography and he wrote a sermon which was all about uh, the anti-slavery movement. It was called A Discourse on, on, on Our Obligation to Thanksgiving for the Prospect of the Abolition of the African Slave Trade with a Prayer, delivered in the Church of Jedburgh on April the 15th by Thomas Somerville. And this was in 1792. Now, that's fascinating to me because it was around about this time that Mary Somerville and her brother stopped taking sugar because they suddenly realised where sugar was coming from and the horrific ways that it was being produced. There is, it's really interesting, actually, when you look at what children protest against. If you think back to kind of pre-COVID when Greta Thunberg started her Friday afternoons of protesting by not going to school and how that grew and grew and grew, suddenly all the young people getting involved. In the late 18th century, there was a growing uh, group of children in, the, in Britain who stopped having sugar. And that was their way of protesting and saying slave trade is wrong. We need to stop it. And Mary and Sam, her uh, brother, who she was very close to, absolutely took part in this as well. And I can't help but wondering if Mary found out about it, about the slave trade. If she talked to her uncle about it, given that she was only 12 when he spoke this sermon and then it was published. It was the first one against the uh, slave trade that was published in Scotland. So he's kind of at the forefront of the abolition movement in Scotland. And I just can imagine the fascinating discussions they must have had. Her uncle Thomas really supported her. She wanted to learn Latin, but everyone was telling her, oh, there's no need, you're a woman, you're a female, you don't need to learn Latin. Thomas taught her Latin. She would go and spend some of her summers down in Jedburgh with her uncle and aunt and her cousins down there. And every morning, Thomas would teach her a little bit of Latin over the breakfast table. They would go for long walks and they would discuss Shakespeare and things in the past. And they would talk about mathematics and astronomy and all sorts of matters like that. He seems to have been a really strong influence in her life. And there's so little evidence about what they talked about. There's so little evidence of their life together, but I can't help but let my imagination go free. He's also a really interesting man in that we have evidence of Robert Burns meeting him. When Robert Burns was doing a tour around uh, particularly the Scottish borders, he stopped off at Jedburgh, which is not that far from Abbotsford, 
Walter Scott's uh, country house. So certainly Somerville knew uh, Walter Scott as well. Uh, and when Burns met Dr. Somerville, he records in his journal, Mr. Somerville, the clergyman of the place, a man and a gentleman, but sadly addicted to punning. And it's said that Somerville gave up the punning habit when he read this extract in Dr. Curry's memoir of Burns. So beware if you start punning too much to a poet who will write a book about you and mention it. So these three places in Scotland, Burnt Island, where she grew up and looked at all the flora and fauna and the birds and observed all of the night skies. Edinburgh, where she learned these skills that she needed to in order to attract a husband, also played a huge role in her writing career. And Jedburgh, where she found someone who could mentor her, who could teach her Latin, who could talk to her about the subjects she was learning about, get her books, lend her things to read and have fantastic discussions. These three places in Scotland were hugely important in Mary's life. She is often portrayed as someone who didn't have much of an education, and I guess in some ways you could argue that was true. But I firmly believe, and the more I'm doing research around this, the more I come to believe that actually she did receive the normal education that a girl would of this time and um, era, but actually that didn't hold her back at all. It gave her skills that she could use later on in life. It also did what it was supposed to do and she got married. Now, I haven't been able to find a picture of her first husband, but this is a portrait of her, his father. They were cousins. I'll show you a family tree in a minute so you can work out how they are all connected. The father is called Samuel Grieg. He was uh, brought up in Inverkeething, so in Fife. So they, the families would have known each other, but she didn't really know him because he was part of the Scottish contingent that went out to Russia to help Catherine the Great set up her navy. And he became an admiral in the Russian navy. Very crucial part uh, there. And his children, most of them grew up and had careers in the Russian navy as well. One of them becoming exceedingly high up. This is a portrait of her around about 23, 24, which was the age that she was when she married Samuel Grieg, the son of this Samuel Grieg. The original plan for Samuel had been that as soon as he got married, he would take his wife back to Russia. But Mary's family were not happy about that at all. So instead, he went down to London with Mary and he became uh, part of the Russian consulate down there. So Mary, aged 23, 24, now living in London, but incredibly isolated. She didn't know anyone there at all. She was alone for most of the day. She did continue with some of her mathematical studies, but she felt incredibly isolated. And Samuel, her husband, didn't approve of her studies at all. She recalls, he had a very low opinion of the capacity of my sex and had neither knowledge of nor interest in science of any kind. Mary gave birth to two sons. The first one, I'm never entirely sure how to pronounce it, so I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I call it Woronzo, uh, it's W O R. O N Z O W. It was named after the he was named after the Russian ambassador in London in 1805 and William in 1807. And the scrap of paper that you can see in the top right that says the life of Admiral Sir Samuel Grieg, chapter one, that was actually written by Woronzo. So it's the the um grandson writing about the grandfather who he never met, but was clearly so proud of that he wanted to research and write about him. Okay, so I've talked about a fairly typical education for a girl, success, marriage, children, but nothing really that has so far led you to believe that this is the woman who is now on the RBS 10 pound note or that Somerville College is named after. What happened? Well, this is where Mary has a little bit of luck and this may seem, seem strange for me to say so, but the luck that she had was the fact that her husband died. Poor old Samuel, who never really wanted her to study, he died when he was only 29 and Mary was 28. And while it is tragic, his death gave Mary an element of freedom. She was a widow. She was a mother, so she also had responsibilities, but she now could have independence. She had a slight inheritance from her husband. So when she moved back to Edinburgh, she could resume her studies. And this time, no one could really stop her. And indeed, 
Uh, from the first weeks of her widowhood, she talks in her autobiography saying, I was chiefly occupied with my children, especially the one I was nursing. But as I did not go into society, I rose early and, having plenty of time, resumed my mathematical studies. She studied mathematics to a point where she started looking at the problems that were in the mathematical repository, submitting solutions, and in June 1811, she won the prize question, a problem which had required a very good knowledge of higher algebra. The editor, William Wallace, who's shown here on this slide, offered to provide mathematical instruction by correspondence, as did his brother. William was to go on to become the professor of mathematics at Edinburgh University. He was a brilliant mathematician, but little known at the time. Indeed, I've seen some uh, scholars who called him one of the best in the world at the time. He directed Mary to study the kind of mathematics that was happening in Europe rather than in Britain. And I will explain more about that in a little bit. But a lot of it was around algebra and calculus. And you could say that it was at this time Mary really fell in love with mathematics. It was a love that lasted throughout her whole lifetime. In her autobiography and in the memories of others, it was clear that she could become oblivious to what was happening around her while trying to solve problems. Jim Seacord, Professor Jim Seacord, who's written a lot about Mary, describes it as a way Mary could switch off from the pressure of domestic responsibility. And in a letter to John Murray, her publisher, written in January 1872, when she is in her early 90s, she says, It is curious that I am so much at home on mathematical subjects as ever I was. And as I have some excellent works, I spend four or five hours every morning in studying them. Now, I'm half her age and I can't imagine doing four or five hours of mathematics now, let alone when I'm in my early 90s. I just find that incredible. 1812, though, she marries again, and this time much more successfully. Now, if you remember back to when I was talking about her birth and her mother being ill, so her aunt being the one that suckled her, that aunt was the mother of her second husband. So she is marrying her cousin. No second cousin removed or whatever. Nope, absolute cousin. This is Dr. William Somerville. They didn't really know each other growing up. He was slightly older than her. Being a boy, he was often sent away for education. He became an army physician and travelled around, particularly in Africa. But by 1812, they met while well, they were both in Edinburgh and they fell in love and they married. So this second marriage was definitely a love marriage and it was uh, the real making of Mary in many, many ways. He had a much more liberal outlook. He was also interested in science and he was very keen for Mary to continue her studies. He would visit libraries on her behalf, the kind of libraries that were closed to women. He would copy and recopy her manuscripts, did her proofreading, arranged meetings with scientific people for her. This is a time when society meant that any correspondence really needed to go through the husband, but William wasn't selfish in keeping that correspondence. He absolutely shared all of their networks. They spent their first, first four years of marriage in Edinburgh. They were already well known in the medical and scientific circles. And Mary continued her studies in mathematics. She also took up the study of Greek with her son's tutor and together with William began to study mineralogy. Of course, she also continued her duty as a mother and a wife and had a growing family, although one that suffered loss. Mary and William had a son who died within a year of his birth in 1814, which was also the same year that Mary's second son from her first marriage died. William and Mary also had three daughters, one of whom died aged 10. And Mary describes her as a child of intelligence and acquirements far beyond her tender years. She also stated, I felt her loss the more acutely because I feared I had strained her young mind too much. This is a time when there are a very strong school of thought that reading would damage girls' minds. And it feels a bit like Mary's maybe wondering if she pushed her daughter a bit too much. And uh, apologies for this being handwritten. Uh, my technology failed me earlier on, but this is to explain how she is related to the two husbands that she married. So in the middle, you have Mary and her parents, William George Fairfax, interesting father, but not in terms of this family tree, and her mother, Margaret Charters. So you can see Margaret and her sister, Martha, that's the aunt that was living in Jedburgh, 
So married to a Reverend Thomas Somerville and they had William Somerville. So that's the second marriage just there. But if we go back to Mary's uh, mother, her grandfather, the man at the very top, Reverend Samuel Charters, his daughter marries into the Greek family and that's where you get Mary's first husband from. So talk about keeping it in the family. Mary very much did that with both of her marriages. After four years of being in Edinburgh, Mary and her husband and family moved down to London. And in the summer of 1825, Mary begins a series of simple experiments, working out whether light rays possessed magnetising power. Through a prism very similar to this one, which is currently at Greenwich Museum, she focused the rays of the sun on a long steel needle, half of which was covered in paper. Her conclusion was that magnetism was induced by the blue-green-violet end of the solar spectrum. And I don't know how many people here have seen the 2014 film Mr Turner about the painter J.M.W. Turner, who you can see here by Timothy Spall on the left. Well, Mary Somerville is played by Leslie Mandeville and is describing this experiment and showing this experiment to Turner. And there is one of his paintings which has a kind of blue, green, violet streak in the sky. And it said that he put that in as a nod to his great friendship with Mary Somerville. They were very good friends together. A report of her observations on the magnetising power of sunlight was published in 1826 in the Royal Society's journal Philosopher Philosophical Transactions. However, if you've noted, you may have noticed in the uh, title down there, although the paper is by Mrs. M. Somerville, women weren't allowed inside the Royal Society. So it was communicated at one of their meetings by W. Somerville, i.e. her husband. Uh, just a little aside, actually, the Royal Society, when it was originally set up in the 17th century, didn't think to ban women because they just didn't think about women at all. And there was an incredible woman called Margaret, Duchess of Newcastle, who is fascinated by science, who wrote poetry as well. And it's just an incredible woman. She really wanted to go in and watch some of the experiments that they were doing at the Royal Society and they couldn't stop her. So she came in, had a look around. And almost as soon as she was out the door, they were changing the constitution to say no women allowed. And no women were allowed until the middle of the 20th century. So Mary couldn't go in at all. William did instead. And a few years later, the Royal Society sent a letter to Mary stating they had commissioned a bust of her that would go in their grand hall to honour science, their country and themselves in paying this proud tribute to the powers of the female mind. So they're tributing the powers of the female mind. They just won't allow that female mind inside unless it's in bust form, which they still have. And the last time I visited, it was down in the basement. So I had to go down to the bowels of the building to go and say hello to Mary, which I do whenever I can. I probably thought it was very strange. The year after her journal paper was published, which by the way was the very first paper written by a woman to be published in the Royal Society Journal, Mary was approached by the man on the left, someone she knew already from her time in Edinburgh. His name is Henry Broom and he was about two years older than Mary, born in Edinburgh, trained as a lawyer, entered the House of Commons in 1810, fought against the slave trade, proposed educational reforms, and was also one of the founders of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge that was set up in 1825. The object of this society was to publish information for people who were unable to obtain formal teaching or wanted to self-educate. The idea was to bring very small books out very cheaply, explaining in layman terms some of the bigger ideas so people could learn more and maybe even learn a trade that way. Henry was very interested in mathematics and he was absolutely wanting a condensed, easy to understand version of a book that the man on the right had published. This man is Pierre Simon Laplace. Born in 1749, a French scholar, sometimes referred to then as now as the French Newton. He was a mathematician, astronomer and physicist, and he's best known for his investigations into the stability of the solar system. Now, I talked earlier about how William Wallace, when he was corresponding with Mary and educating in her mathematics, was pushing her towards the European style of mathematics. It seems to be that as soon as Newton came along and did all of his great discoveries, the British Society of Science just went, brilliant, don't need to do any more now. 
don't need to investigate and kind of relaxed a bit. Whereas in France and in Europe, they went, oh, this is really interesting. How can we expand it? So in France, he had done a lot more work based on Newton's laws. And Laplace had been able to prove once and for all that the heavens were ruled by Newton's laws. There was no divine intervention at all. It was considered a book second only to Newton. But the problem was, not only was it in French, but Laplace was a difficult author to understand. A mathematician once wrote, Laplace, on the other hand, explains nothing, is indifferent to style, and if satisfied that his results are correct, is content to leave them either with no proof or with a faulty one. So Brun wanted to bring out a version of Laplace's books, but in order for people in Britain to understand what was going on, it wasn't just a strict translation. It wasn't about turning it from French into English. It was about turning it from French into something that the British society could understand. And he felt that the only person who could do this was Mary Somerville. So through a letter to her husband, he approached her to make this request. Mary agreed to do it, but only on the condition that if the manuscript was no good by the time she was finished, it was to be thrown on the fire. It took Mary three years to do this. She recalls that I rose early and made such arrangements with regard to my children and family affairs that I had time to write afterwards, not, however, without many interruptions. A man can always command his time under the plea of business. A woman has no such excuse. At Chelsea, I was always supposed to be at home. And as my friends and acquaintances came so much out of their way to see me, it would have been unkind and ungracious not to receive them. Ne nevertheless, I was sometimes annoyed. Within the midst of a difficult problem, someone would enter and say, I have come to spend a few hours with you. And what she says there has echoes of, in a few decades later, Virginia Woolf's plea for a room of one's own. Mary worked for three years. And as I said, it wasn't just a translation. In fact, that word does not do it justice at all. The academic Catherine Neely has described it as a rendering. In other words, making it clear. So all of the diagrams you can see there, all of the diagrams and tables throughout the whole book, none of those existed in Laplace's original. She had to take her understanding of algebra and calculus to translate all of the work that Laplace did into a system that British scientists mm -hmm. could understand. Unfortunately, by the time she had done all of this work, Broom's series of books that he was producing cheaply were not selling at all well. And so they had decided not to publish any more works, including Mary's. However, one of Mary's very good friends, John Herschel, happened to know of a publisher called John Murray, who agreed to publish it. The Mechanism of the Heavens appeared in 1831. It's the first book that Mary had published. She was 50 at this point. And this is where her career really starts. For not only does she publish that book, but she also works on four more books. Her second one was even more successful than the first. It was called the On the Connection of the Physical Sciences. It went into 10 editions by 1887, many of them updated by Mary herself, each bringing to the public the newest scientific ideas and practices. Indeed, in the sixth edition, published in 1842, Mary wrote a prediction that another planet was out there ready to be discovered. Uranus was the last one that had been seen in 1781. And this prediction that Mary had made, based on the mathematical and scientific work that was already out there, inspired astronomer John Couch Adams to begin calculations that led, in 1846, to Neptune being discovered. In 1835, Mary Somerville and Caroline Herschel were elected honorary members of the Royal Astronomical Society, the first time women had ever been given such a, a role. Mary's third book, which was her most popular work, was her two-volume Physical Geography, which appeared in 1848. It was about geography, geology, botany, astronomy and zoology, again looking at the most recent discoveries in all of these fields, to present an overview of current understanding of the natural world and the Earth's place in the universe. It was an immense success, appeared on university textbooks for many, many years. And again, many of them updated as the editions went on by Mary. 
Now, time is running on, so I just want to mention a few more things to do with Mary that fascinate me. And the first is around uh, the networks that she had, both Edinburgh and London and in Italy, where she lived for the last 40 years of her life. But in London, Mary became famous for small evening gatherings that she held at Hanover Square, parties that were very entertaining because, as Mary says, she and her husband were intimately acquainted with every person of note, both scientific and literary, in London. And one of the people that she became very close with was Annabella Byron, the mother of the woman on the left. Annabella had been wife to Lord Byron. They had not been married for very long before he disappeared to the continent. She was also interested in mathematics and became a very good friend of Mary. This is her daughter. We now know her as Ada Lovelace, originally Ada Byron. She was the very first uh, mathematical computing uh, programmer, she is often being called. She never knew her father. She was the only Ill only legitimate child that Byron ever had. Indeed, she wasn't allowed to see a portrait of her father until she was 21. Byron was known uh, as mad, bad, dangerous to know. And the fear was that if she saw a portrait of him, that would send her mad. So to try and protect her, she wasn't allowed to see her portrait of her father until she was 21. But Ada also became really interested in mathematics and her mother employed a series of tutors to help her out, including asking Mary Somerville to be a tutor of Ada Lovelace. They became very close and Mary even chaperoned Ada on visits to Dorset Street in London to see the machine of the gentleman on the right, one Charles Babbage. So it was Mary who introduced the two together, which led to this relationship where they work on this computing machine and the computing program. And indeed, in the US Navy, I understand that one of the computer programs they use, they've nicknamed Ada after Ada Lovelace. So without Mary, you could argue that we wouldn't know Ada Lovelace as a name today. And they correspond as well. And through their correspondence, you can see Mary's helping Ada with basic trigonometry and equations, but also providing Ada as a role model. Her Mary's son, Waronzo, was the one who introduced Ada to Lord Lovelace, so introduced her to her husband. So that gives you some idea of how the, close the families were. And Mary then helped Ada in juggling this uh, problem that women have always had, how to carry on with your interests and do your own work, but also raise a family. And so there are a number of topics, including how hard it is to be a mother that are covered in some of these letters. Ada remarks about the weaning of her first child, speculation about the second, uh, about the sex of the second, and interspersing all of this with requests for books and study materials, such as Newton's Statement of Reasons or a set of geometrical models. Although Mary lived the last 40 years of her life in Italy, where it was much cheaper to live, finances were not great uh, for a reason I won't go into, I haven't got time. Um, and also her husband, William Somerville's health, it was felt would be much better in Italy where it is warmer and drier. But she did visit Britain one last time in 1844. And in that time, she came up to Edinburgh and on Princess Street, she bought this microscope set. It is kept by the History of Science down in Oxford, uh, the museum down there, and the curator who allowed me to come and see it, so this is my own photographs that I'm showing you here, uh, describes it to me as a kind of a starter set. So someone who's wanting to learn about the, how to use a microscope and the microscopic things that you can see, that is what Mary bought when she was 63 years old. And so even when she's going on in life, she still has this thirst for knowledge that does not let herself stop learning. These are some of the little slides that she had with it. And as she worked so much on understanding the microscope that her very last book published during her lifetime when she was 89 was on microscopic science. So she never stopped this desire for knowledge, kept her going and on and on. Over the last five years of her life, she wrote her autobiography, which was published posthumously and edited by her daughter. A paragraph in the manuscript drafts reads, although I had recorded in a clear point of view, some of the most refined and difficult analytical processes and astronomical discoveries, I was conscious that I had never made a discovery myself, that I had no originality. 
I have perseverance and intelligence, but no genius. She died quietly in her sleep on the 29th of November, 1872. She always stated that she should be buried wherever she died. And so it is in Naples Cemetery that you will find this, except <laughs> I tried to go there in February 2020. It's my 40th birthday. I thought, let's go to Naples. Wonderful. Obviously wasn't aware of what was coming and that would be my last chance to go anywhere for quite some time. And unfortunately, the English cemetery where she is buried is now all locked up because there's no one looking after it. And so it's falling apart. And so I couldn't get in. This is a photograph from a website uh, from someone who went to visit many years ago. Nowadays, you can't get in. So there was me on my 40th rattling the cages going, Mary, I'm here. All I could see was about that much of her toe from the tomb. When she died, the obituaries called her Queen of Science. Whatever difficulty we might experience in the middle of the 19th century in choosing a king of science, there couldn't be no question whatsoever as to the queen of science. And that's why she deserves to be remembered today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruth. Fascinating stuff. Mathematics and astronomy, what, what, what more could you want? <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm sure there will be some questions. Uh, so if you're you're still good, do you want to take a glass of water or anything to refresh? No, yourself? I'm okay. Thank you're you. You're okay. Any questions? I'm kind of going to. If if nobody else is going to put in, then I'm I'm kind of going to ask one first of all, which is um, I know she was a she was a um, a, a fellow a, an honorary fellow of the royal astronomical society but i i understand that she wasn't allowed to visit there either no definitely not uh, she was made honorary member of a number of societies that she couldn't actually visit so it was almost a kind of a way of placating her sorry you can't come here we go have a lovely title instead uh, many other women, the Caroline Herschel in as well, uh, was this. Uh, Mary was also made an honorary member of a couple of American societies, as well as Italian societies and the Irish Society for Astronomy as well. So she had lots and lots of recognition and lots and lots of titles, just many places that she couldn't visit at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, Caroline Herschel was back in Germany, I think. So uh, yes, she, exactly. it, it was some something of an academic question. But yeah. Mary Somerville was there in London and yep. just wasn't allowed to visit. Not allowed at all. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> John, I, do you have a question? Could you elaborate a bit on the financial difficulties you, you said? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, they were never incredibly well off. But uh, William Somerville um, had a habit of, he was just very generous and he had a cousin who wanted, who needed some help. I say he had a cousin. They would have had a joint cousin <laughs> in some way together um, who needed financial help and then seems to have run away with the money. And so they, by helping someone else, they lost a lot of money. And this was at a point when Mary and William were in their 50s early 60s. So William had bad health, he had to retire. So Mary became the main breadwinner in her 50s. She got a pension uh, after the first publication. Uh, everyone was talking about it so much that the British government wanting to be seen to be supporting the sciences, decided to give her a pension. So that huge helped a huge amount. Um, and obviously a little bit of money from her publications, but not a huge amount. Mm. Um, and certainly not enough to keep a family because although her son Waronzo married, her two surviving daughters never married. They always stayed with their parents. So they needed enough money to keep the two of them and the two daughters going, which is why they moved to Italy. There were a number of people from Britain during the 19th century who moved to Italy because it was so much cheaper to live out there. And they had no permanent base in Italy. They just moved around mm. from place to place which is why she'd stated, bury me wherever I die. So her husband, William Somerville, actually died in Florence, and that's where he's buried. Uh, Clive, um, do, you want to, uh, do you want to ask your question, Clive, or, uh, or comment? Uh, well, I'll... can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. OK, I'll ask it. Um, I'm always a bit puzzled when, when I see pictures of the house where, uh, where she grew up. Um, it always looks very modest to me, for uh, given her, her father was a vice admiral. Um, was it was it unusual? Is there anything to say about that? 
So this is how I moved in before he became a vice admiral. And wow. I would say that even when he became a vice admiral, he did not get the money that he was supposed to. As a family, they just seem to have had a slight issue the whole time about not getting the money that they were they were supposed to get. So it took a very long time for him to get the title. He was uh, awarded it during the French Revolution kind of period of fighting, and he got it, but it took a very long time for it to be appointed. We're not entirely sure why. Um, it's something I'm hoping that I might be able to find out a bit more about. But he didn't get the pay as a vice admiral for a very long time, well after Mary had got married and moved out. So the house that the, that is in Burnt Island is not the house of a vice admiral. It's the house that they lived in before he became a vice admiral. Um, and it was all that they could afford at the time. OK, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. That's a good question from Maggie Collins. When did Oxford decide to name the Women's College after her? Four years after she died. She had no idea that the college was there at all. Um, they were building a college for women. It was going to be the first one that was secular. They already had St Hilda's, but that was a very religious college, whereas um, they wanted to build a college for any woman to be able to go to, and they wanted to name it after someone that would inspire the women that went there, and they decided Mary Somerville would absolutely inspire people coming from this quite humble background and not receiving any kind of formal education in terms of mathematics but having that determination I think inspired so many people when they met her that they wanted that to carry on so they named it about four years after she died. And she never she never knew never an inkling that it was going to happen. Never what an inkling it wasn't being discussed at all when she died. What a pity. What I know. Pity. Uh, David. Yes, uh, that. Oh. Just trying to unmute myself. Uh, yes, uh, that was a really. You're muted again. You're muted, David. Yes, I keep muting and unmuting myself. Uh, yeah, that was a very entertaining and interesting talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I remember reading that in the recollections of Mary Somerville that she said that her chief regret in dying would be that she would miss the transit of seeing the transit of Venus. She only missed it by two years because it was in 1874, the next one. But also I remember seeing that she gifted a, a telescope made by John Smeaton, the civil engineer, to the Royal Astronomical Society. Given those two things, um, did she do much observing herself, especially in her later life, do you know, or was she purely... Uh, involved in theoretical issues oh no she loved looking at the sky absolutely she did a lot of observing particularly as a kid but I think it's something that she carried on throughout her life um she loved particularly moving around because the night sky would have been slightly different every time she moved around and what could she see from that point of view so definitely she she would look at the night sky whenever she could uh but I was I didn't know about the the gifting of the telescope that's lovely I'm gonna have to look into that what a brilliant thing to do Yes, of course, uh, uh, when she moved to Italy, suddenly she'd be able to see further south, as it were, yeah. uh, so, so further south in the sky. So that might have been another reason to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. definitely. Yeah, um, we... And she also saw um, you know, the uh, Mount Vesuvius exploding one day. And I think that, I mean, she doesn't say this explicitly, but I can imagine that she, because she definitely painted it. And I can imagine she would then be thinking, well, how does that affect what we can see at the, in the night sky? So I can imagine her again, starting to think about that, looking at all the ash and the, the clouds and everything um, and kind of going, oh, I'm going to get my telescope out tonight and see what I can see. Yeah. And actually, I would recommend anyone who wants to, this is the, um, uh, so the, her autobiography was reprinted by Canongate. She's a publishing firm based in Edinburgh. And this edition is edited and introduced by Dorothy McMillan, who sadly is no longer with us. But what Dorothy did was that she looked at what was published and then she looked at the manuscript drafts and she has put back in what her daughter took out so that we can see the kind of what Mary originally wrote. And then Dorothy has talked around that. For example, there is one bit where Mary talks about how uh, one of her uncles has taught her to swear and her daughter took that out that was not in the originally published she clearly did not want people to know that her mother used to swear so it's really interesting looking at that kind of that change in uh in perception and what's what she wanted to make sure that people didn't know about her mother 
Great detail, yes, yes. Do we, do we know what her, what her swearing was like? <laughs> no, she doesn't go into too much detail, but she, she was clearly proud enough yeah. of that that she yeah. put it into her autobiography. Naval family, they were. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, can you, uh, uh, if anybody else asking any questions here, can you tell us a little bit about um, who do you think you are? Who did you, who did you yes. research? Ah, this was many years ago now, but the first programme I worked on was Jeremy Paxman. I remember may remember him and uh, his way of uh, interviewing politicians was very, very hard nosed. This was in the second series of Who Do You Think You Are? And actually, it was my research that made him cry. He was the first celebrity to cry in Who Do You Think You Are? Nowadays, most of them cry. But he was the very first. And it was the fact that it was Paxman as well. I still remember I wasn't involved in the filming, but I still remember the phone call from the director going, we've had tears. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so I worked on him. I worked Excellent. on um, Matthew Pinsent, who was the Olympic rower, um, actually appeared in that program. I've worked on David Mitchell, the comedian, um, Fiona Bruce, the broadcaster. Uh, yeah, quite a few of them. Monty Don was a lovely one. Monty Don was related to the Keeler family in Dundee, which even today is a really big name. They produced Marmalade, which is a nice connection back to Mary Somerville. Um, but the letters are fascinating because although the main um, part of the company was in Dundee and run by the older brother, the younger brother was in Guernsey, which is where they would have the sugar shipped into so that they didn't have to pay as much tax on it before it then goes up to Dundee. And the two brothers hated each other. And the letters <laughs> between them are fascinating because, of course, they're crossing each other. The letters are crossing each other and they sometimes forget that. So they're responding to the latest letter, even though they know that actually there's been you know, a distance of time between them. So, yeah, that was a fascinating one to do. Excellent. It must be such a fun job to work on. It is because it, it, you just don't know what you're going to discover. Absolutely not. Do we have any more questions? I flick between the two screens, so apologies if I'm missing anybody. Okay, I think that brings things to a nice conclusion. Oh, um, sorry, uh, David. Sir uh, David's put a note into oh, the uh, oh, to yeah. the Somerville gift to the RAS. Thank you. Yeah, should take a co copy that. <laughs> yep. Paste into paste into <laughs> a document before we before we finish. Excellent. So. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, a you. fascinating story. There are certainly lots of details there that uh, uh, I certainly had no idea about. Uh, so we wait. We wait for the biography. That's yes. A... If anyone knows of any 18th century patrons that are still around today and want to give me money so I can finish researching and writing, please do let me know. That's what yeah. I need. <laughs> Bit thin on the ground, but uh, yeah. you, you never, you never know. You never, you know. never know. So thank you so much, and uh, shall we <laughs> applaud in the usual way, either virtually or or, or by hand. Thank, thank you, thank you so Ruth. Um, uh, so uh, I hope you all, I'm sure you all enjoyed it. It was a wonderful talk. Um, if you uh, want to come along to the next um, SHA meeting, um, I, I stand corrected. It is indeed Saturday, 20th of April at the Birmingham and Midland Institute in Birmingham. Um, uh, Gerard and myself have put together, mostly Gerard, but uh, I'll claim some of it, uh, a wonderful programme based around Astronomers Royal. Uh, so we have uh, talks about five separate Astronomers Royal, including Arnold Wolfendale, who used to be a, a, a vice president of this this very society uh we've invited martin reese we're not sure if he'll come along he may send a message uh, but uh, we do have uh, uh, all sorts of detail about the the, the amazing uh, the amazing people who uh, who were uh, our, uh, our primary astronomers in the country and indeed in scotland we have peridor i think he's here today talking about uh, a, a, a scottish astronomers royal so that's that's good as well our next webinar is on May the 8th, I do believe, and we have the legendary Virginia Trimble uh, uh, coming, uh, logging in from America. Uh, I, I will confirm details on that, but I really hope that she'll be able to talk to us. I, I haven't got the, the, the title in front of me, but it's something along the lines of, is it still history if I was there? So I think uh, she, ha she has a long and very, uh, very distinguished career to tell, tell us all about. Uh, so uh, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Look forward to seeing you all in Birmingham in, in a few weeks' time. Thank you so much once again, Ruth. It's been absolutely fascinating. A really, really good presentation. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. Good night, all. Thank you. Night.